Hello everyone, my name is Loco and welcome back to another professional match of StarCraft 2. Now what I got for you today is a very high level match of professional Zerg versus Terran right here on Acid Plant LE. Spawning in the top left corner of the map and playing with the red Zerg drones, he's from Italy. He's 16 years old and he goes by the nickname of Raynor. And his opponent spawning in the bottom right hand corner of the map is the blue Terran player. He's from South Korea, easily one of the best Terran players on the planet. Of course, we are looking in the main base of Gumiho. So here's the thing about this match. Some of you reached out on Twitter and mentioned that if I did not see this game live, I should really go ahead and cast this final match of the base trade TV cross finals. And it turns out, I actually watched the first couple of games of this series alive. It turns out that the final match, this game right here, so this is game seven of a best of seven series, is apparently the best one of the entire match. So I'm really excited for this one because I watched the first rounds alive like I mentioned. I sadly was not able to uh, to watch the final ones as well, but apparently it went down to game seven and apparently the players saved the best for last. So here's what I can tell you of the rest of the series, at the very least from what I've seen. Gumiho in recent times has been favoring that mech-based Terran composition. You know how a lot of Terran players love and swear by the Marine Marauder Medivac kind of style, the transition to siege tanks and liberators and all that? Gumiho plays pretty much the exact opposite end of the Terran spectrum. He loves playing that mech-based composition with heavy Hellions, Thors, siege tanks and all kinds of other armies. Now, other than what a lot of Terran players like to do, where they play extremely passive when they play mech, they basically just simply sit back for the entirety of the game and they eventually manage to go up to a push that goes across the map, Gumiho plays a rather aggressive style of Terran mech. He is not afraid to move out much earlier, leaving his bases relatively exposed. And Raynor, of course, he's great at that counter-attack based style, so I'm really curious to see how this one is going to play out. Now already, we do see a really quick third head tree here from Raynor. This is way before he could even scout out his opponent's natural. Of course, you may argue that that is just a little bit too greedy if you're playing in the grand finals, but this is what makes great players great. They take calculated risks, uh, depending on what their opponent has been showing them so far. So even though, of course, you don't want to go for that third hatchery blindly on the ladder, just because that's just not going to pay off, if you've been playing six games against Gumiho already, right, and you kind of know uh, his tendencies in the first place, he loves playing that macro-based style, it's a good educated guess, or a good educated guess, rather, to, to uh, assume that he makes that command center on the low ground once again. And if that's the case, and you think it is the case, go ahead and grab your third hatchery much much sooner as well but that's definitely a calculated decision and not something you want to just simply pull off every single game now Gumiho is doing something very similar here right look at this he left the Reaper at home he doesn't want to take any unnecessary damage to like pull first style but as soon as he realized that it was not a pool first, he almost immediately threw down the third command center as well. So both players are sort of trying to outsmart and outclever each other with build orders that are on paper extremely greedy and very risky, but they sort of have faith in each other's judgment and there's sort of like this gentleman's agreement in which they believe that neither of them is really going to attack very early on into the game whatsoever. And I already like this. Because um, this has a lot of risk, but also a lot of reward potential. Now we've been looking in the main base of the Terran player so far quite a bit, and judging by the fact that there are indeed once again two armories coming up, I think that Gumiho will be going for that mech base style. Now this has been unscouted so far by Raynor. I would not be surprised if Gumiho decides to wait for a little while longer here as well. Just because, of course, he hasn't shown additional factories yet, and since he knows that his opponent didn't scout these uh, these uh, armories, he knows that at this point, Raynor doesn't know whether or not it's bio or mech. He's likely gonna wait with adding on additional factories. There we go. Until that Overlord is shooed away, effectively leaving his opponent in the dark. Now, Double Evolution Chamber is coming up. Very interesting play here by Raynor. Usually against... 
One, one, one. So one barracks, one factory, one starport. You actually go for the lair and like a Roachborn or a Baneling Nest a little bit earlier. But apparently he has read something where he feels confident to go ahead and to simply transition towards one, one upgrades instead. So keep in mind, right? There's no detection here for Raynor. There's no Overseers. There's no Baneling Nest. There's no Roachworn. It's literally just Queens and Zerklings. So this is on paper, once again, a very greedy style, but it's one of those calculated decisions that a lot of these pro gamers of this caliber make just because they kind of know and expect what their opponent is doing. Imagine if this Banshee had Cloak. <laughs> that would essentially be the end of the game, right? There's no Spores. There's very little here that Zerk can do about it. Is there a Transfuse? Oh my god, that was beautiful. Raynor actually trying to bait that Benchy away. Closer towards the ramp, trying to bait it to go after the Queen, but apparently Gumi Ho is just a little bit too good for that. I love these subtle differences, man. This is what gets me so excited about StarCraft 2. These are the kind of games you do not want to copy on the ladder, the kind of strategies and build orders that you don't want to necessarily straight up copy, but that are perfectly viable if you can read your opponent well and if you have a certain expectation of what your opponent might be going for. Now, speaking of what he might be going for, look at that. Gumiho manages to roast quite a couple of those Zerklings for practically free. Nice little catch there by Gumiho. But, of course, showing these Hellions is a dead set giveaway that Raynor is going to go up against that mech-based style once again. And if he would be confused, I guess the floating uh, the floating barracks <laughs> should, uh, should be the nail in the coven, right? That really indicates that Gumiho is not producing out of his barracks. Fourth hatchery is coming up now. Third command center has already landed here for Gumiho. He's adding on more and more of these factories. So plus two, plus two will be started here in just a bit. But at the same time, a Thor drop is moving across. Gumiho has been a big fan of the Thor drops. He puts them in high impact mode and targets fire down uh, queens as well as hatcheries and the whole shebang. They do a stupid amount of damage. It's actually very difficult to stop this. Here we go though, these Banelings have to go on all of those Hellbats, if at all possible. Queen's trying to deal whatever damage they can, but you see the roasting here has been absolutely on point. Queen's trying to target fire down some of these Metavex as well, but it looks like Gumiho is dealing a tremendous amount of damage here with the units that he's got. Those Hellbats and Hellions are picking up so much value. Now one Thor there does end up falling, there's still that little bit of Medivac Arras where he's continuously dropping and trying to heal up one of these Hellbats. I think eventually though, all of these units will be forced to get away and all things considered actually, only two drones went down. Now I would say that that most definitely, oh my god, look at that trade, that most definitely was a valuable trade there for, oh man, did he lose to Thor anyway? Oh I think he did, yeah he did. Um, that most definitely was a valuable trade. At the same time, fourth command center here on the right-hand side was taken. Gumiho just barely manages to keep that one alive against the Zerk and counterattack. And speaking of Zerk and counterattacks, a couple links once again were threatening here to go across the map. Hellbats just barely morph in in time, but I don't know if it's enough because plus one, plus one has finished or has finished up here on these Zerklings, and it makes them much, much more powerful against this kind of army than they normally would be. And Gumiho recognizes the threat, immediately decides to cancel the fourth command center and builds it a little bit closer to the third as well as a fifth right as a follow up. Now what Gumiho was doing in a lot of the games that I've been watching is go for a push right when plus two, plus two finishes. So we see those upgrades just about to come down. Ooh, a bit of a supply block right here by Gumiho, showing us that he's human. Um, I'm curious to see if we're gonna be uh, spotting something similar in this game as well. Those Hellions and Hellbats are trying to do whatever they can, but right now, once again, right, ooh, that's a big pickup there. Gumiho ends up losing a handful of them, and that means that if he even was planning to go for a push earlier, that essentially is now shut down. You really, really need those Hellions and in particular Blue Flame before you can properly make that mid-game push. Now the main was scanned just now here and it shows that there's still a lair. So no Hive Tech just yet. That kind of indicates to me, as well as to Gumiho of course, that he doesn't really need to move out yet. Gumiho can just simply sit back and macro up a much bigger force. He could continue doing Thor Drop Arras. Oh my god. Is he gonna pick up all of them? He's got a lot of Medivac. Come on, dude. Bring a third draw Earth Thor to the party. It's fun, dude. He might just go for some Hellion play instead at the same time. And while the Thors and the Hellions are moving across, 
I think that this uh, this fourth command center indeed would just be landing in a little bit. It looks like it might be transforming into a planetary fortress as well. Thor drop making its way towards that third. Now remember that third base was weakened quite a bit by that Hellion aggression earlier, right? So just target it, dude. There we go. The target down the hatch and it falls. And this is so difficult to deal with if you're a Zerg. Great pickup right there by Gumiho. Of course, that cost them barely anything, and it makes the Thors one of the slowest and immobile units in the game. Very, very mobile if you if you put them into Metavex. I love it. Really good play. While that was going on, a fourth command center was indeed grabbed too. Raynor's sort of hoping that there was a base on this side. Instead, he's gonna find that once more. That planetary has been taken there on the right-hand side of the map. And apparently, Raynor still decides to go for a move right here. He's gonna be very careful. The majority of that mech army, though, was forced towards those couple of Zerglings. Big blunder there by Gumiho. And eight SCVs, 13 SCVs end up going down. At the same time, Planetary Fortress does finish up, so these Zerglings, oh my god. They will be fright as well, but still, 13 SCVs in exchange for a handful of Bane Links, and once again, a lot of time is going to be critical, because Raynor is transitioning to wipes in As soon as Broodlords are out, as soon as Vipers are flying the map, that mid-game timing that Gumiho can go for is basically out of the window. He wants to try and deal some damage right now, but Raynor is trying to prepare for this engagement and he's trying to buy himself time so he can transition towards Brute Lords, right? If he manages to go up to Brutes, he's gonna be in a much better spot. At this point, there's barely any Viking play whatsoever for Gumiho. He's got a couple of them up in the air, but really not that many, so the majority of his anti-air would be these Thors. Now, Thors are still very good, in particular with the 3-3 upgrades that are right now finishing up against that bio bay or against those uh, biological Brute Lords. But still, right, this is definitely, um, once again, a bunch of Hellions end up going down there, but this is definitely still a game where Gumiho feels pretty comfortable, I can imagine. He's getting up to that maxed out Terran death pool. Using Thor drops to clean creep tubers. Man, we've come a long way in playing mech in StarCraft. <laughs> Even bringing in uh, an additional medivac just so you can pick up in case one of them ends up going down. And the third hatch here will be retaken. Raynor should be able to grab these Hellions with relative ease too. Blue Flame though, definitely does change uh, the tide of battle. My god, that is a lot of value there that the uh, Terran player gets. But here is the Greater Spire as well as that Viper transition that I was expecting. At the same time though, the Thors were dropped off right over here. Just target the hatch, dude. Yeah, there you go. Just hit the hatchery. Look how much damage to deal. One of the Thors is not even fighting here. Transfuse is now going down, but I've got a feeling that this base is still in a lot of trouble. Bailing's trying to do whatever they can. Medivex pretending to be war prisms. And while apparently two Thors did not get their evac, two more did get picked up, and apparently that means that the hatchery also ends up going down. And this would be a big pickup. Woo! Nice boost there by Gideon. He just barely managed to get out of there. Rainer trying to set up a bit of a run by. Still, man, these Hellions are doing so much work. What a beautiful play here by Gumiho. He's maxed out right now, right? He's maxed out. He knows his opponent doesn't have Brute Lords out yet. This would be another perfect time for him to move across the map. Now, in the other games of the series, Gumiho was going for a much more aggressive style, where he really tried to move across right when his opponent was going for all of these things and whatnot, right? But there was one critical difference as well. What Rainer was playing in the previous games that I watched, uh, was way more focused around um, approaches and then also, of course, swarm hunts. Now, in this game, that's not the case, and I think that might be the reason why Gumiho is trying to play this a little bit more passively. He is now maxed out, he's got all the upgrades in the world, and he's got a stupid amount of siege tanks. 18 siege tanks. 18! Let's look at the cost efficiency so far. Oh my god, exactly 10,000 minerals were lost, but that is 100% in favor right there of the Gumiho. Once again, these siege tanks, man, they are dealing the damage from a distance. Now, planetary, or rather, um, parasitic bomb there does also end up killing quite a couple units. Hellbats and Hellions, once again, moving right here on the left-hand side. But slowly but surely, right? Gomio is starting to march to the center of the map. And this is a really, really easy reinforcement pattern. This always makes me think a little bit of chess, where controlling the middle part of the board is far more valuable than controlling the outer edges. And since Terran Mech is as slow as it is, I think controlling this section of the map is very important. 
very, very important. Scans will not confirm that there are Brute Lords out, though. That is uh, very much so the saving grace right now for Raynor. All we really need to do is Parasitic Bomb the Vikings, Blinding Cloud the Thors, and let the Brute Lords do their work. Obviously, having Hydra Link Bane at the ground is still going to be very helpful, but it all comes down to Corruptors, Brute Lords, and Vipers right now, that air-based Zerg army. Queens, of course, with the transfuses, they can they can definitely help out in these moments as well. This is going to be a close call, though. Gumio army, or Gumio's army, rather, is still looking very solid. Now, here we go. Very classic Raynor timing attack. He does this all the time. He sends the Zerglings, or not a timing attack, I guess, a counter attack. He sends the Zerglings in right at the point where the Terran player is moving across. And actually, interestingly enough, Gumiho is splitting up his army. That is something we do not usually see Terran players do. Calculated decision there, right? Keep in mind, remaking these tanks at this point is very, very expensive. 21 SCVs, though, have already gone down, but at the same time, the Hellbats, oh my god, they roasted an entire mineral line worth Siege tank trying to kill the base, blinding Cloud though, preventing that from happening. And Gumiho does end up losing the Siege tank and he does not get the hatchery kill. He did, however, kill 23 drones there uh, in total. And I think just by losing some of these Siege tanks, Gumiho intentionally also opened up some supply for more Hellions that he can morph into Hellbats to kill the Brutelings. More and more Thors right now, as well as more Vikings. So he's gonna go ultimately into that that counter for that Brute Lord based army. How many Brutes are out right now? That's 10 Brute Lords already. Rainer's still using those Queens as well, right? Keeping them close to those Brute Lords to make sure he can transfuse them if he needs to. And this is actually uh, gonna be a very interesting engagement because there's a chance with proper Viper control. Where are the Vipers? That he can, uh, that he can definitely still get the value that he's looking for. Well, there we go. Four of them in total. Now, he's got to be careful. Raynor, that is. But the fact that there's still, of course, a low HP hatchery right there on the left-hand side of the map. But this engagement, man, it is not slowing down. Parasitic Bomb being activated on as many of those Vikings as possible. Blinding Cloud slowing down the advancement through this choke. But Gumio's army is looking absolutely massive. Supply-wise, there's no denying that Raynor is very far behind. Hatchery also ends up falling, but there's really not that much to deal with this amount of Brute Lords. As soon as those uh, Corruptors are, are taking care of all of those Vikings, right? It's just down to the Thors now to clean all of it up. The Hydra's coming on from the left-hand side as well. They're trying their very best to deal as much damage to all of those air units as possible. And right now, a couple Thors still remain, but there's no denying that there's more and more Brute Lords. Five Thors versus three Brutes. Well, I guess that's five Thors, but some of them are still moving across the map. Raynor, though, while he means to, or he seems to be cleaning up this engagement, he is losing a tremendous amount of workers. And apparently, it is indeed going to be enough. Raynor managed to keep his opponent at bay for a very long time. But Gumiho shows us how to play that mech. And it's so interesting, right? Like I mentioned at the beginning of the video, for a long time, mech was this really immobile unit composition where you would just simply sit back for the longest time and eventually move across the map. But Gumiho was the one that really started mixing in Medivax and go for a lot more harass while also transitioning. It's very cool to see how this is gonna, gonna continue to develop, you know? This is something that has been undergoing uh, in, in like the meta of StarCraft for like, I would say probably two years. Before that, people tried to play mech, but it never really worked very well. Gumiho really is starting to figure out a way to make this work against really strong Zerg players. And like I mentioned, right, in the other games, Raynor tried to go for Swarm Host and Gumiho just absolutely smashed it. He basically would load up his Hellbats into Medivax and then drop them where the Locust would go. And that way he could prevent his Siege Tanks from killing, uh, or, or rather from dying. He would unseize the tanks and whatnot. It was absolutely beautiful. Gumiho was dealing with it like a boss. I'm really curious though, right, with the new patch coming up, probably like mid to late November, with battle cruisers getting a buff and um, cyclones getting a, a pretty big overhaul as well. I'm very curious to see how this kind of mech-based composition is gonna play out then. 
Also, obviously, Thors are going to be significantly better when it comes to dealing with massive units and are going to be much weaker uh, when it comes to dealing with, for example, a group of Zerglings. They're going to die much easier because they're losing an armor, but they're going to take a lot, or they're going to be able to deal a lot more damage to, for example, Brutes. It's going to be a very interesting dynamic. I feel like the new patch, right, it's directly buffing Gumiho's playstyle, and he already seems to be uh, polishing this kind of playstyle for, for years now, and it's getting to the point where it looks absolutely unstoppable. Very well done. Now, I hope that you enjoyed watching this game. If you did, hit that like button down below. If you want to see more, make sure you hit that subscribe button so you get a notification as soon as I upload more. A special shout out to the Patreon supporters. Thank you guys so much for all of your love. But for now, I want to thank you for watching. Have an amazing day. Do not forget to smile. And I'll see you once again in the next one.